Every once in a while, a game comes around and just changes everything. It shows us something completely new, and it takes forever for everyone else to catch up. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, 10 games that were ahead of their time. Starting off at number 10 with Crisis. Now, 2007 was an all-time great year for games. We have Bioshock, Modern Warfare, Mario Galaxy, Halo 3, God of War 2, The Orange Box, and Crisis. And just looking at these games, you can tell that one of these things isn't like the others because Crisis was just light years ahead of everything else visually at the time. Now, maybe in art direction, you might like some of the other games I said a little more, but in purely technical terms, Crisis was a cut above. Like, compare it to 2006's Elder Scrolls Oblivion, and it is no contest. Oblivion looks downright decrepit compared to Crisis. The game had dynamic lighting and shadows, HDR rendering, dynamic environments, real-time clouds, and a lot of new effects. It took four years before the game was able to be ported to the Xbox 360 and PS3, and even then they had to cut out a massive level of detail because it was just too much for systems to handle. In general, those ports were severely compromised versions of Crisis, and we wouldn't get a decent console version of the game until the next generation. Now, of course, with all these fancy graphics effects, it meant you needed a beast of a PC at the time to actually play it. There's a reason Can It Run Crisis became such a meme. Now, it was a question people were legitimately asking for years after the game came out. In gameplay terms, there's not a lot going on here that wasn't done in the original Far Cry outside of the nano suit powers, but graphically, this game is so far ahead of its time, it's almost hard to describe. At number 9 is Eternal Darkness. Now, compared to Crisis, graphically Eternal Darkness is definitely nothing to write home about, and that's not a huge surprise considering it was originally meant to come out on Nintendo 64 before development moved over to the more modern, but still early 2000s GameCube console. What makes this game so ahead of its time isn't the graphics, but the ideas. The game's most impressive feature is how it plays tricks on the player using the sanity meter. As your character gets exposed to the Lovecraft-esque horrors looking around, the sanity meter slowly drains. As it gets lower and lower, the more likely you are to experience hallucinations. At first, they're relatively harmless, strange noises, blurry vision, but when the sanity meter was low, you get fourth wall breaking stuff, like the game making it look like the console crashed, the TV disconnected. Some of the nastier tricks are, are like things where you think the controller wasn't working and your save files are erased or whatever. It's kind of stuff that had been done in isolation in other games before, but the way Eternal Darkness messed with players was just entirely original. And it was the originator of a lot of the fourth wall breaking tricks we see in so many games today. At number 8 is Nier, which was released in April of 2010. Now, Nier saw some pretty mixed reviews. Most of the complaints focus on the game's ugly visuals and not particularly exciting gameplay, and it really didn't get the kind of attention it deserved regarding the interesting things the game did regarding its story. Uh, like Joystick, which is now defunct, gave the game a literal 0 out of 10. Like, reviewers mostly did not like this game, and sales weren't high. But but in the past 10 years, the game's gotten a major critical reevaluation for its innovative and mature storytelling. Like, the gameplay still isn't great. The original version of the game's pretty stiff to control. Uh, the remake, in which they made it handle a little bit more like Platinum Games near Automata, yeah, way better, even if not perfect still. But the reason why it's so ahead of its time is so obviously how it presents its story. Instead of everything simply ending after beating the game, you're given the option to play through it again, but this time with new scenes that give greater context to what you're doing. Certain events become completely different after multiple playthroughs too, which is strange enough, but the game also isn't afraid to go on weird tangents like this entire section where you're in choose your own adventure game. It's a game that just marches to the beat of its own drum, and a lot of creators credit it as a major inspiration for their games. At number 7 is Demon's Souls. Now, back when the original Demon's Souls came out, the gaming landscape was just a really different place. Pretty much everything about the game went against conventional wisdom at the time. The game was hard when games were becoming more accessible. It was obscure in a time where everything had unskippable tutorials that explained every single aspect of the game. It had a major focus on boss fights when boss battles were being de-emphasized. All that's really cool, but not exactly ahead of its time. I mean, Kingsfield was a markedly different game 
him, but it wasn't so far removed from Demon Souls that you can't see the DNA between them. And that's from like 1994. From Software goes back a ways. What was trailblazing about Demon Souls was actually the asymmetrical multiplayer component. You could team up with other players, you could fight them, you could leave messages to offer clues and look at people's bloodstains, see how they died. It turned what is, I mean, technically a pretty lonely experience into a weirdly communal one. It's a brilliant feature that's been copied by so many games at this point that it's hard to keep up. Now, Demon's Souls is famous for its unrelenting gameplay, but the thing that really makes it ahead of its time is that multiplayer component. And number six is Planescape Torment. Like Nier, Planescape Torment isn't ahead of its time because it's in gameplay features or technical wizardry, but storytelling. In terms of story, this game was simply a cut above everything else in 1999. And this was a time when stories were evolving rapidly, like Final Fantasy VII came out in 97, Metal Gear Solid came out in 98, and those games were absolutely revolutionary in not only how mature their stories were, but how they told them. That said, Torment was still something very different. What's unusual about the game is that the goal isn't to stop some great evil or change the world, it's much more personal. You're the nameless one, an immortal being with no memories of who he is or why he's even immortal in the first place. All the RPG staples are here, there's some combat, but in comparison to Baldur's Gate or Fallout, there's much less a focus on fighting here. Like, you'll be spending far more time talking than you will be fighting in this game. Only recently have we started to see games that use more RPG mechanics everywhere, but aren't primarily about killing enemies like this goes back much further and number five is Shenmue now you can't do this list without mentioning the granddaddy of all the open world games. In comparison to Grand Theft Auto 3, Shenmue seems like a game that came from another planet. Rather than being about creating a large world and filling it with potential for arcade action, Shenmue is about building a small but believable slice of life. And that did not always translate into fun gameplay. But just the simple fact you could open every single drawer in Ryu's house felt like a huge step forward in interactivity in video games. Instead of just throwing you right into the action, the game's more about building a mood and letting you get to know your neighbors and friends. It's almost closer to a life simulation game than an open world action game. There is some combat eventually, but the real meat of the game is in the mundane. You can buy toys, play arcade games, get a job, all things that at the time people were not playing video games for. Now you can make a video game about literally anything. You can do farming, trucking, even uh, playing arcade games, but Shenmue was the first game to do any of that. At number four is Live a Live. To the West, this game was relatively unknown until 2022 when it got a remaster, but now that it's out uh, of Japan, you get to see how unique and forward-thinking this seemingly inessential RPG really was. There's a lot that's unusual about it. Uh, it's an RPG, but instead of being in a fantasy world, it's set on Earth, and each of the seven playable characters comes from a different moment in history. There's RPG mechanics, like turn-based battles, but there's a lot that's unique about the game as well. Like the Twilight of Edo Japan chapter, where where it's possible to play through without killing anyone. It's much easier said than done, requires a lot of trial and error and puzzle solving, but it is possible. This section has been cited as the direct inspiration to the creator of Undertale, and it's one of the first games to have a legitimate non-violent gameplay option that's actually worth doing. Probably the most unusual chapter in the game is the distant future, which stands out in that it's almost entirely combat free. This section also contains maybe the first instance of the unkillable stalker that pops up in a lot of horror games nowadays. Like the only way to survive is just avoid the creature or run away. Years before that mechanic popped up in like Amnesia, The Dark Descent, or Alien Isolation. Those are two examples of the ways that this game was ahead of its time, but they're far from the only ones. It was basically an experimental RPG that was probably a little too weird for the US back in 94, but its influence can be seen pretty much everywhere. Oh yeah, and while we're talking about survival horror influence, Sweet Home is another game that basically invented the survival horror genre, but it has random battles rather than an unkillable stalker. At number three is Super Mario 64. Like you didn't see this one coming. Like it's easy to take for granted though, to be fair, how much Mario 64 was a step forward in video games as a whole. While every other third person game had a fixed camera and unwieldy controls, Mario controlled like a dream and had what is probably the first actual third person camera in a video game. It took years for any other developers to quite match what Nintendo did with Mario 64. Hell, 
Games today still struggle to match how natural Mario feels to control in this game. With this game, they basically invented the 3D platformer, and for a first go, it is a remarkably complete game. The camera is probably the biggest issue. The mechanics behind it are revolutionary, but the actual camera controls were not great. The moments that the camera did work, however, are incredible though. And that comes down to the way the game would combine a controllable camera that would switch to on rails camera at certain moments. This sort of thing is seamless these days. And while it didn't take long for developers to at least approximate movement in a 3D space, it was a long time before the mix of locked and free camera controls became standard. The technology used for the game was also ahead of its time in many ways, like the way the game would switch between high poly and low poly models, depending on the distance, among other things. Um, it was just a highly influential game, and it took a long time before anybody really cracked what made it feel so good to play. Like, pretty much every single 3D game today owes something to Mario 64. At number two is the original System Shock. Uh, you don't get a lot more ahead of its time than System Shock. It was released in 94, and at that point, most FPSs were just trying to be Doom. System Shock, though, way more, way, way more ambitious. Basically, like a sci-fi dungeon crawler. System Shock, like, introduced a lot of staples in games that would be lumped together as quote-unquote immersive sims. This game lets you explore, collect items, read logs, which expand your understanding of the story and place and you get popped into some scenarios in multiple ways you upgrade your character i mean compared to other fps games that were out at the time this was moody mysterious and immersive and it came out before doom 2 like to say this game was influential would be a ridiculous understatement games like thief deus ex bioshock dishonored prey all these games owe a huge debt to this game for all the ideas it introduced to the gaming landscape One lesser mentioned feature of the game that was actually even more ahead of its time is all the ways you can change the difficulty, which are actually similar to accessibility options in modern games. Like you can change the combat difficulty, puzzle difficulty, story difficulty, uh, which affects the time limit that you have to do certain things like the mini game difficulty and all these things have separate sliders. And System Shock came out 20 years before those things became commonplace. And finally, at number one, Trespasser Jurassic Park. So up until now, uh, every game on this list is at least pretty good, right? Most of them are great. This one, it's a mess. It is unfinished, it's super buggy, it's incredibly awkward to play at times, but it was also beyond ambitious. The people making this game clearly wanted to make something revolutionary, but the technology to do what they wanted to do just wasn't there yet. Like, so many features of this game were revolutionary. There was no HUD, except for this weird heart tattoo on your character's cleavage you could look down and see how much health you had with. But beyond that, no HUD. When using guns, there were no ammo pop-ups. Instead, your character would say how much ammo was still in the weapon eight shots heavier than i thought five four and like at the time this type of stuff was just unheard of but we're starting to see more fps's nowadays kind of get away with this hudless setup it's generally more story oriented fps's but still also the dinosaurs in this game had advanced ai routines that were meant to control how they behaved but were basically just all set to aggressive because the developers couldn't actually get them to work and this game had a fully functional physics simulation in 1998 six years before half-life 2. the size of the island was also impressive for the time too as well as the environmental storytelling that was surprisingly mature for a game where you look down at your boobs to see how much health you have uh, trespass is a game that swung for the fences and fell flat on its face it was so far ahead of the time that they're just it wasn't possible to do what they were trying to do and when it came out the game was just considered a total disaster i do like to think of it as a noble failure though because i mean the stuff that they came up with people were doing eventually anyways that's all for today leave us a comment let us know what you think if you like this video click like if you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. Best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription, so click subscribe. Don't forget to enable notifications, and as always, thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at FalconHero. We'll see you next time right here on Game Ranks.